going on? This is Ava on the beat, and Platinum Music Cruise from Springfield, Massachusetts. And I'll be here for Spitcher Game TV. So I remember last time you was telling me we had when we had the interview, mm -hmm. you was um you was told to study the charts. Mm -hmm. So well, my question is to you is how much have you learned since then? New. Well, I say working the movements and everything as far as it, it's more meticulous um, than just making records and studying like there's a whole thing behind it. Right. So figuring out who's writing the records, figuring out who's engineering the records, who's in the room, who's the A&R and really finding what they're working on also contributes to what's on the charts. Like you see patterns and, and different ways to really work on your music where back then I heard that like type of thing, but I, I wasn't sure what that really meant. At this point, I'm like, okay, you're working for what they need at the time now. You know, you got to figure out what people are working on. And if you're not really in the loop, you don't know. But, you know, you can kind of see the patterns of releases and the way that the, everything is moving. So um, definitely, like, understand who's working on what and deliver what they got going on. You know, um, versus you making 10 records and just throwing them out there. You want what you throw to stick. Right. Mm hmm so have you been able to like study a certain artist and be able to match his sound with a certain beat? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I did um, a joint on Big Walk Dog's last album, Trick City, that dropped in September. It was over on uh, Atlantic at 1017. Um, the joint that I did for Big Walk Dog, though, with my guy Beniano and JB, um, it was for Young Boy originally. And then NBA Youngboy either didn't take the beat or it didn't get on to him. And the executive at Atlantic gave it to Big Walk Dog. It was his first album. And that was a different record. But once I, I'm like, okay, let me see what tempo they're working at. Let me see what the key is. Let me see what the cadence of this beat is. And try to match it in a sense, but also add my own sauce to it. And just, you know, common sense, like, Look at their catalog. Look what they got. They got going, and and you know the best way to do that is to just communicate and text through and try to cut out as many people in the middle as you can, just so you have a direct understanding of what's going on, mm -hmm. right? Because um, you could get placements and you could get records out, and you could have one, two, three, four. I got a couple, but. You have a career off your relationship. You don't have a career because you got one, two, three, four off. You got a career off of a consistent level of okay, this is that, this is what's going on. You know, every every mm -hmm. rapper and producer has a pair, every legendary pair. You know, because we could take part in big things every so often, but I think like with what I'm trying to do now, I'm trying to be set foot in my lane with that artist rather than just make beats for everybody and send it out because it's you throw a thousand and you land one but how could we find a way to throw five and stick three you know what i'm saying yeah and just common sense like the point where you want to just make music and let it do its thing versus you chasing um other opportunities because it's there mm. you know it's, it's a relationship based game i mean you know so if I'm texting beats back and forth, that's way better than passing it to a random person and then waiting and waiting and waiting. And hoping that they respond. And, yeah. and, and I'm sure you'll get one off again. Like, that's not, that's not a problem. That's like the second best option. Um, first option is being in the room. You know, because you got to think if you're working with all these local artists your whole life, um, think about all the records you got with your friends that are local and whatever, or your producers or your engineers. Y'all don't think about it. Y'all already know each other. So imagine if that person just so happened to have a major label situation, then everything that you'd be doing would just be accounted for. You know, everything would, would go towards your catalog, your leverage, and your equity that you own in your publishing, and everything like that will actually show something, no count. Mm. All it really takes is for it to be on a major at the end of the day, like have it be something that's accounted for. Because mm. everybody makes music every day, but if it's not on a major, it might not count towards a deal or towards your value when going to negotiate deals, mm. and things like that. Do you think there's any way to make, if you do a record for a local artist, to make that count towards getting a deal? If the artist, um, okay, so let's say an A and R the label goes and likes what they got going on. They have a, a catalog of music that they've heard. They like it. Maybe they can work it. So, a lot of times, 
they'll call in a good writer that might be able to fine tune what you did. Your delivery was great, this and that, and the third was great, but the translation to an audience that doesn't know you might not be all there. Maybe the people that know you will connect more with the record, but there's writers that will know how to crack down the best hook for you to deliver on that record. Maybe they'll switch a word around, switch a beat around a tiny bit, like get it to where they need it. Because it might be 75% there, but if they know how to take it to 100, that's basically the job that you're looking for. You're looking for creative input and you're looking for a direction. You know, if you're running around like a chicken with your head cut off, like we all have to for a while, it's like you just got to do what you got to do. But there just comes a point where like, okay, maybe I could do this better. And maybe the better option would be to have people who already did it on your side instead of people that mm. believe in you like because they can only do so much they good in this lane this lane this lane but if they ain't experiencing what you got going on they can't um even if they wanted to know what to say to you all they can do is support what you got going on but that's why it's kind of like your job to figure out what is it that you need what is it that you have and you need to enhance is it do you have a hundred thousand monthly listeners do you have a million did you hit one record but maybe you feel like you didn't have what you needed but these people already know what they're looking for you know these labels are actually trying to sign artists and sign producers that add value oh. to a situation have you had a label come to you asking for a specific sound that you had to give them mm -hmm. yeah yeah all the time um so like let's say like kevin gates working on an album um, oh. i got a couple with gates i got uh, two or three with him and I sent the beats that I, I felt Kevin Gates is Kevin Gates on, you know, and that'd be the melodic guitar joints. That would be the hard, rugged joints that you would hear on, like, the By Any Means album. Um, but that record I did with him was called Shit. That record was kind of my interpretation of his first album. Wait, wait, why would you interpret it as that? No, the, 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 the song was called Shit. Okay, I get you. The song was called Shit. And that record was an interpretation of the sound that he was using on his first album with the heavy brass and the heavy beat and stuff like that. Oh. So I knew kind of, in a sense, I knew the direction. But sometimes I'll ask, what is the pocket people are looking for? Like, what is the pocket in terms of what is the direction people are going in right now with their beats? Is it is it more of a melodic feel? Are you looking for the normal? You know, and I might get a description like more melodic, dark guitar around this tempo, et cetera. So... Now I got to figure out how to deliver the record correctly. Okay. And, and, you know, I might have beats, but I need to send the right beats. So it's time to call somebody up that I can know can deliver, you know, because if, mm. if anything, there's dope producers, but what is the right producer for this situation? You know, you got to do some research. It's not um, just, I got beats, you know, nobody needs your beats. They need the right record. Right. Just like nobody needs... Lyrics without a beat. It, 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 you got to just find your like role in the situation. Yeah. So what would you say is yeah. the um the record that kind of lifted your career the most to the next level? That'll be um, "Move On" by Lil T J. Mm -hmm. Why that, would you say that one? Well, that record. Um, so I had placements before. I had um, some stuff with Soldier Boy back in the day, like seven, eight years ago almost. That was dope. That was my first placement you know and then i had other placements with bigger artists that were features and so so forth so i'm credited but that record was my first major label release so that was my introduction into the world of the business and how things actually operate there's a whole other thing that i didn't know about which is kind of cool so when that record counted for something and it hit billboard the album debuted number five on the 200 which meant period that was number five that week but then on the rap charts it was number two wow um then there was the follow-up a month two later um we did kevin gates only generals two and that record was number two on the rap charts so now i'm getting calls from the executives and i'm getting calls from all the business people over and i'm learning how this works and and that might be okay you you, you got this um do you have anything for for so-and-so mm. right there from there, it's kind of like, well, yeah, I'm going to send those over. Now those beats that I didn't think I could get off, they'll at least hear them. So it's just more so now I'm just migrated into the business. Okay. Um, but that record changed a lot mm. of things. So that's what kind of like led you into more business rather than the creative side? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, this isn't a talent show. This is a business. And... It's about money and it's also about what works and you know there's a combination of it there's a fundamental piece that you you have already but 
you gotta understand where you fit in any situation. Mm -hmm. Like, and it's up to you whether you want to do that. Unless you just want to do it for your own pleasure, that's fine. But you know, you gotta deliver what you're looking to do. You can't just make beats and say, okay, well, I know I'm dope and I'm good. No, you gotta kind of meet in the middle and figure out what people need. And if you could deliver, well, congratulations. That's that's where you succeed. And you know, the more um, things that you do, the more opportunity you get. Mm. Um, yeah. Mm. So what would you say? I know you like record um, mm -hmm. records with different artists right. as well as produce beats. Mm -hmm. What would you say is your favorite thing to do in a studio? In what sense? Like in what sense is as in um, you enjoy recording the record more? or mixing the record, or making a beat for the record? Um, probably, I'd say it depends on the person. It depends on the day. Um, a lot of times it is recording. A lot of times it is mixing. Um, beats, it depends on the vibe I'm getting in the room. Like the, the thing is, it all depends because, you know, artists pick beats differently. You could pick a beat that you're cool with, you'll try someone, but then there's those beats that play in the first five seconds and you know what's gonna come off the top of your head. That's the shit that I like to then record and catch the vibe and get mm. it going quick because you don't wanna lose it. And then there's mixing where you hear a dope record. Um, I was recording with one of my clients, uh, Hundo the Chef, man. Hundo's the Chef, man, he he cool. Um, I think Slime Poe did that beat, but I like the beat a lot. I like the record, um, and I'm, you know, I just want to add a couple touches to it just to polish it off to my liking because, you know, I'm just hearing my perspective. So I'm like, ooh, let me get the stems and, and add my piece to it because that's my producer brain. Like, I want to mm. just fill it in a different lane and maybe spread some reverbs out and do certain things. And I really, like, enjoy working on that record. And that wasn't my plan. That wasn't right. something I, like, tried to... Um, you know, for us, it was just something I'm like, I like what I'm hearing, but I want to touch one or two things because I think it will sound dope. So that part, yeah, recording is up there. So it just mm -hmm. depends. Oh, it depends on the situation. Right. 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 Have you ever been um, nervous? In like any sessions, any situation or, or most of local? Or any any situation. Yeah, um, especially like major label sessions. Um, not necessarily nervous, but like it also depends on the communication because I've had major label sessions that were put together from A&Rs and that was cool. I showed up. The A&Rs and the managers were cool on my sound that I was bringing. They already knew what I, what I had in my catalog, so they knew what my vibe was. They knew kind of where, what direction I was going to go. The artist sometimes doesn't feel magically the same way the same day. So mm -hmm. I've played beats in sessions that I completely flopped in and I might have played 30 beats. And um, pick one. That's happened. I've played sessions, uh, beats and sessions that they picked the first one that wasn't even done yet, and they still cut it. So it's a mixture of the two, because it's, it's about your your face card. You know, you want to be the person that they call on, and you can deliver every time, mm. because this is a business, and any and it goes for anything. If you've got a camera guy that you love, man, and he delivers every time. There's no explanation. If you got a barber that you go to and he gets your fade right without even telling him anything, there's no explanation needed. But right. when you need to, you know, you still need to prove yourself when you're coming up because there's never a such thing as you're done, you know? You're always mm -hmm. proving yourself every day. Yeah, but when you do land it and you had that pit in your stomach, it's always something that's worth it. You mm. know, when you're not comfortable, when you succeed, then you know you just grew, you know? Um, had you been in your comfort zone and did what you normally do, but well, you already know how to do it. So it's mm -hmm. a balance between like being nervous and look what could happen after though, if you execute correctly. Right, kind of yeah. like something there to keep you on your toes to yeah, keep yeah, striving yeah. for more. Yeah, everything that's new, that gets you that pin your stomach, try it, do it. Take every opportunity you can. All right. Unless you have something better to do, then you're free mm -hmm. to do that. Now I heard an um, mm -hmm. interview with Swiss Beats and he was speaking on how you know, a lot of producers, they don't show their face. You don't know what they look like. He was speaking on how they're leaving a lot of money on the table. Do you believe that's true? Yep. Because, first of all, it also depends on the type of person you are. It, 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 but this is a this is a thing, right? I'm, I'm going to give you my perspective on it. 
So there was an era where you had Swizz, PK, Dame Grease, Jake One, Just Blaze, um, Timbaland, Scott Storch. Um, you had producers that you didn't hear about, another producer that you probably didn't hear about publicly. Maybe if you're older, you know, like Self. Produ you know, Self is a producer that used to work with Murder, Inc. And he used to work with a lot of guys. Mm. So he was responsible for a ton of great DMX records. But he worked alongside Irv Gotti and collabed with him on as far as that went. Okay. You might not have heard of him. He was responsible for a ton of great records. But maybe he didn't want to be the spokesman. Maybe um, the writers don't want to be the spokesman. And, you know... I think you technically are leaving money on the table, but it just depends if it's worth it for you because it's a lot that goes into it. These interviews wouldn't be that exciting unless I talked about what I do, right? So, right. but it's about branding and it's about getting insight. You know, all this stuff matters. Now, I could go on and say, hey guys, I'm doing, um, you know, an artist event where I'm going to say, yo, play your music for me and I'm going to charge you money for it. I'm not going to do that. Because I truthfully don't know what to do with artists right now. Oh, okay. But I could say I'm leaving money on the table. Yeah, but that's not the money I want. Mm. That's not the money. I'm not going to play my brand as, hey, guys, bow down and, and pay me $50 to listen to your music for, for a second. Because unless I know what to do with it, there's no, it's not going to change anything. Okay. But if I hear a record that naturally drives my attention, I know this person already, and I could call them up, then I, I, I don't even want your $50. I don't want your mm. money. I just want to take this and put it somewhere. You know, and so there's ways to get money, but there's also ways to make a career happen. There's ways to build your brand. So it just depends on the type of person you are. Are you more, you want to maximize off of your brand right now, or do you want to build your catalog? Because um, both are valid. It just it depends on how you want to do it. You know? oh, okay. So there's different lanes for mm -hmm. people. To... But it's a different era right now. It's not the same era where CDs were $10 and you sold a half a million CDs and you're making $10 million. You know, that's simple. Now you got to collect the money from YouTube, Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, blah, blah, blah. And then you have to make sure all of it's been collected. And then, you know, things are delayed because there's a bunch of producers on one album and you got to account for every agreement, every uh, check that's sent out, every manager involved. And... You got to think back then it was maybe easier because you had seven producers on an album instead of triple. So, okay. you know, it all depends. Like, there's different ways. That's why you see, like, maybe reality TV stars start themselves off on reality TV and are able to grow their brand and get more opportunities. Mm. So it's, it, it all depends on what lane you want to. Do you want to be a straight musician or do you want to be a figure? Or both. Right. Mm -hmm. You never know because... Maybe not showing your face could get you more money than. Yeah, sometimes that's a, that's a part of your brand is being a ghost, and kind of that's the look at MF Doom. Right. We never really saw his face, and well, I can't confirm what his face looked like. Maybe we've seen him and didn't know, but he's responsible for a lot of legends. And there's nothing to even say. He's MF Doom. Like, yeah. it all depends. But it's up to you. It's still kind of like um gave that mystery like effect especially after you had passed just to know that you never know what it mm -hmm. and we, we heard about it like a week like. later or something and it was like okay well he he died and we didn't know mm -hmm. but it just depends you know i i don't think that it's wrong i think man you know what if people don't want to deal with politics and deal with the social aspects of it um don't you, there's people for that. There's managers. There's there's publishing companies that handle your bread. There's whatever you need. It just depends on how, what lane you want to take. Just like the guy selling beats online. Oh. I never was great at that. I've done some business um, with beat stars before. Um, I've talked to the people over there. And I tried it. I'll, I'm not mad at it. I'm not mad at it. But for example, I just had better results so far shaking hands in real life in my sessions and just one person at a time because it's just it seems like there's more power in that relationship than there is a guy on paypal pressing by right but once again it might change maybe i'll crack my code with that um mm. so it really just depend oh. so do you still sell beats online or only in person i think i have stocks of beats that are still up that you could get oh, okay um 
I haven't posted on YouTube or really posted on beat stores, beat stars, Airbit. Um, because it seemed like I was just, I, first of all, you know, especially in sessions, I could play a beat after I record a session and sell it right there for 20 times as much. Mm. So I could lease a beat for $300 in real life. Um, if I cracked it and I had, you know, 20 people leasing my beat every day, some people really do that and that's dope. But I, I'm trying to debate on like, I'm doing the placements. I'm handling a lot of business right now. Okay. Um, so it's really consuming, but you know, if I had the right lane for it, I would do it. Mm. Um, it's just just not the time right now. I mean, yeah, but if I find a better, like I said, a better opportunity with it, then I'll do it. Right. You know? So now I hear a lot of people from Springfield say that, oh, we never got that person. We don't have like that one, I guess, artist that has broken through. Oh, okay. Have, have you met anybody that you say that broken through or I would say like close to it? Well, um, off the top of my head, I could say my reference point is always Filth Town because I was a part of Filth Town since 2015 and we had a record called Snooty that was pretty up there. Everybody in the city knew it. Yes, I think for the, was for the time that we were in, the community was just people that made music and they just made music. People, that's what we did. There was not much talk about industry stuff. We were just making music, cutting records and we were catching vibes and we were right. doing a lot of great things. I felt like that was the mark that I set locally. Like, this is what Breakthrough looks like locally. Mm. And, and you know, how that went was crazy. Do I think that, I don't know of any artists that went platinum out here, um, but you know, I don't know. All right. So um, what part, what role did you play in, the, in Snooty? I didn't play a role in Snooty, but the catalog that came after that, I definitely did a few things. Like um, me and Joe Schmo met a lot. Me and Cavalier, rest in peace. Um, you know, OG Jamie was around at the time, okay. you know, around Joe and all of us, man. And uh, I was, I started to be a recording engineer during that time frame because I was uh, recording with SK because he broke his arm one day mm -hmm. and he came to the crib and he's like, bro, do you know how to use Pro Tools? I said, no. He's like, okay, well, I'm gonna show you how to track vocals and then just send me the sessions to mix them after. And, but just the community that we had around each other, the six, seven of us, man, um, banging out music all day and having releases and really packing out shows um, was something that I'm like, wow, that was picking up, wow. you know? Um, and it wasn't calculated as hard. It was just, it was the right record. That was dope. Mm -hmm. I didn't, I didn't know you was back then, like part of the fifth town. Yeah, man. I mean, I was a kid, man. I was 16, 15, mm -hmm. like, but I was also just trying to get my name out there and like everybody had does man and that's when people went at least a beat for me for thirty dollars mm. because it didn't hold no value compared to going on youtube and pressing download right and when this goes back to branding this goes back to why would i pay you and mm. that's a subject that's touchy but i understand that now that i'm older like it's the brand so you believe that now that your brand is worth more, mm -hmm. now now that your beat now your beats are worth more. They are, yeah. Mm -hmm. Because the same beat that I made three years ago from TJ, the Move On record, let's put it in perspective. That record sold half a million on its own. The album sold a million and some change. Okay, it's, I don't know what it's at right now. That beat was passed around to local artists, three local artists. Um, other people that I just fucked with that I felt like was sound cool in it. Oh. And it didn't have any takers. It, and to me, the beat was okay, but the label saw something in that beat that I didn't. And they did what they did and passed it around and it got to where it needed to be. Um, and I think that it's more so trusting this person's instincts. And it's just like if you were to be in the studio with Pharrell, you might trust his instinct because of the track record and because of his lane and his brand and what he's oh. done. Um, you know? But... That's just what it is, especially if you're coming up and you don't really have a budget like that and you have to kind of weed out what you can replace and what you can't. If there's a video that you need to have done, you have to pay a camera guy. Right. Or at least do something. Or if you don't pay for that, you pay for editing. You, you have to source out something. So 
if you don't believe that that beat is going to give you a return, I get it. Hmm. But then there comes a point of maybe I'm tired of YouTube beats. Maybe I'm tired of just picking whatever and I want to build a sound. Hmm. Maybe I want to have a relationship with somebody and really figure things out. You know, um, that's partly why, like, I go back to the barber theory because barbers is a perfect example. You sit in a chair, they know what they're doing. You have no reason not to go to them. Right, you trust them. And even their kids probably are nice at cutting hair because it's just mm -hmm. how it is, you know right. what I mean? And then no explanation needed. So you, you learn more about yourself, so I can't really blame an artist for not wanting to pay money for a beat mm -hmm. now that I'm older because there's no reason that you have to. There's YouTube and guys selling beats for nothing. Mm -hmm. Why, what, what's my excuse to sell a beat for $300 for a lease when I didn't have anything to show for it? Mm -hmm tangibly oh, okay in the eyes of the average person mm -hmm. that's just something you got to be accountable and understand yo your brand's not there yet but once you have the track record it's up to you whether you want to pay it or not mm -hmm. all right so i'm gonna give you one one last question before we're out of here mm -hmm. thank you for your time what would you say is the biggest contributor to making someone's brand successful so your relationships like for example um let's take let's take your producer friends that sh that we all have we all know producers we all know artists let's say that they're in the studio with somebody and you don't have access to them maybe you're in a different part of the country different city at the moment maybe you're busy and they got an opportunity for you that they can't do by themselves but they know that you can i'm here and but I know I, I know what you got. Maybe you got a beat that this guy needs and you're my friend and I could call you real quick, send it over because I can give it to him right now. Or maybe you have um, a connect for, for example, an interview where Buddy might work at a media agency and you have no use for it. But your friend over there, that's dope and you can make mm -hmm. the connection easy, the introduction. Use it. It, it. it goes back to relationships and bringing results to people, especially when you're the new guy and your job, you, you have to bring results to the table as the rookie. You gotta pay your dues, you gotta do what you gotta do. Right. You know, as long as you have relationships and get results with people, you'll be successful. Is you know, it's just you gotta keep track of it. Mm -hmm. You know, you you know, that's why this is such a big deal because that reputation matters. Cause we really don't know what's hard until it's it's up mm. and it's out. And it's trending or it's not. Right. It's it's all intellectual property. This is not a hammer. You can't what what is it? It's just intellectual property. So we're trying to build structure in what this is. And this sound doesn't really exist. It's a noise. Mm. So you're paying tens of thousands of dollars exclusively for a piece of noise. That's what you gotta sell. Mm. So this is the challenge, right? So then you bring in all these factors and say, what results am I going to get for paying for this piece of sound? Mm. And maybe you have an answer, but that's part of it. This is, this is why this is an interesting thing to talk about. So um, I you know? kind of got like a new perspective of it because mm -hmm. you're kind of um, somewhere in there. You're not only selling the sound, you're selling the results. Yeah, Coca-Cola. Look at Coca-Cola, bro. I'm sure it is. Okay, let's take let's take this. Let's take this. I was in Atlanta, and I had went to I don't know if it was American Deli or if it was Zaxby's somewhere. I asked for a Dr Pepper. Now this is important. I trust Dr Pepper. I've drank it my whole life, just like Coca Cola. I drank it my whole life. I know what it tastes like. It's not going to change. It's easy. Whatever. I was at American Deli, and they only had Pib. Now what's Pib for those who ain't been to the South? Pib is like Dr. Pepper, but smoother. Uh -huh. It's not an off brand of Dr. Pepper. It's its own thing that they got over there. I tried it. It was fire. But had I not just tried it, bro, I would have been like, nah, I'm stuck in my ways, man. Mm. I'm stuck in my ways because it's just the trust that you have in brands and things. You know, they're not going to let you down. So right. once you build that rapport with anything, even as small as a drink, it holds its standard. You know, you go to a club. Or you go to get you a favorite beer, man. Like for example, I love Blue Moon. Then they'll go to the I'll go to the bar. Oh, we got Shock Top. I don't want that. Mm -hmm. I, I, it's okay, but it's something about that Blue Moon that's special to me. 
when I ask for it. So I'm like, okay, but maybe it'll change. But you see what I'm saying? You got to yeah, build a rapport with it. It's as small as that. So as long as you can show what you can bring to the table and why and how this is special, you know, that's what you got to work on as a brand. This is why we trust in so many things. Like, it, it, it's just as important as, as building up a brand, bro. And that's why the Swiss is probably talking about people leaving money on the table. Mm -hmm. But also, it's like the exclusive, the exclusive sense of things is also special. You got Louis Vuitton things that cost a lot. And you got Hanes t-shirts. Everybody needs a Hanes t-shirt one day. Everybody needs a normal pair of socks. All right? We always have bought those. But then there's just something special about buying a Louis piece or buying a Burberry shirt or buying whatever. Right. It makes you feel good. It's a fashion statement. It has its social dynamic with it. Right. So we have our stashes where we need them. Mm -hmm. um, and that you'll learn that in music, too. You, you'll have your standard cuts, your album cuts, and you'll have your singles. And you'll have this piece that's like, this is the one. You know? Nice. You just got to just see what fit. There's no rules. But um, that's my take on that. True. So brands, certain brands hold a standard. They do. And it's up to you to either build your brand or, or you know, figure it out. Do you want to be a boutique or do you want to be the Gucci shirt? Because, mm. look, no, there's nothing wrong with each one. But just know you don't have to sell 10 million of these to equal this. Or you can release a limited edition special shirt, handmade. You take it out the box. It has a special smell to it. It has a special texture to it. It's something about the fabric. You gotta think it's the smallest things, but you're one of a kind, maybe, or one of ten instead mm. of one of you know a million. So right, it just, it just you know it all plays in a role, and that's why you know people buy designer clothes and, and do this. It makes you feel good. So it depends on what does that for you. Is it a beat from Pharrell or a beat from YouTube? I would love a beat from Alchemist. I don't even rap. I just want to buy one. I don't want to hear it. You know what I'm saying? Right. There's just something special about that sound that was a soundtrack of my life growing up, or DMX, or fucking, you know, Dipset was a heavy inspiration to me. Like, a heat maker's beat to me is still almost like a Kanye beat. You feel what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, because it's just what I grew up on hearing. So, like, it's up to the individual. But that's what this is all about, is, is really finding what works for you. Um, this is a business, so... Do your research for sure. Definitely. All right. Thank you. Um, before we out, um, can tell them, tell people how to hit you up, how to contact you if they ever need studio time or beats or production. Okay. My Instagram is Avery on the beat, A V E R Y O N T H E B E A T. My uh, Facebook is the same. Um, my email is the same, Avery on the beat at gmail.com. Um, I'm operating out of Springfield. I travel to other studios. Um, you know what I mean? So if you want to do some business, let's lock that in, um, get something going and build a sound and get things rolling for real.